everyone to another date on Kubernetes live stream. Not just another one, but a very special one because we've got a hot topic today. I've got rhythms, I've got rhymes. If operators are your thing, then now is the time. We are joined today by John from DataSax. But before we get into that, just a couple of announcements that I want to make. If you have not seen that all of our KubeCon uh, co-located event, DOK Day Talks, are on YouTube, I will drop the playlist right here. Please feel free to check that out. Another thing that if you haven't checked out and you definitely need to check out is the DOK Data on Kubernetes Communities Reports. We interviewed uh, 500 organizations about how they perceive this opportunity as well as the challenges of running data on Kubernetes, exactly what's going on when we're thinking about end users. All right, so take a look there, lots of interesting insights. We're gonna be talking about that more, extending that information, going deeper um, with some of the members in our community as well as bringing on other end users to hear about their experiences. Now, like I said in the beginning, We've, this is live stream number 97. We've had this topic of operators has been a recurring theme that's come up again and again. In terms of tackling this issue of running stateful workloads on Kubernetes via databases, storage, et cetera, seems that operators is one of the, the, the best solutions that we seem to find up until now. And we're always curious to see how these operators come about, what's necessary to build them. If we're talking about the skills in the team, if we're talking about the time that's necessary to get it going, and then also perhaps the fine tuning that will come into that. And Cassandra has not been a stranger to our community and we're happy to have it back on today with Kate Sandra, but to talk about that further is going to be John. John Sanda, very nice to have you with us today. Could you just give us a little bit of background about your experience? I know we were talking before we got started. Don't want to make you repeat too much, but about how you got introduced to this whole concept of data on Kubernetes and then your experience with operators from beyond that. Yeah, uh, so uh, I've got ex uh, involved with Cassandra early on in a uh, number of years ago in my career with, with at Red Hat, um, like a lot of people working on a system that ran into scale issues and then turned to Cassandra as a solution. And then later that found its way into uh, that solution in OpenShift and that was uh, even pre-stateful sets. And, and then it was um, with some of the work that I did af after that, after Red Hat, saw that there was some of the, the problems that people were trying to solve with other solutions, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, it became clear that, um, that these are they're hard problems and that Kubernetes offered potentially a, a better solution. Not necessarily that easier, but, but better. And, and I saw um, also around this time, saw a lot of work in the operator space with for different databases in Cassandra. And it just became clear to me that it was, it was, it wasn't, it was a matter of it was a question more of when, not if it would be possible to make this a reality. And, and that got me really excited. And, and eventually it, you know, led to me to data stacks and to the Kate Sander project. Very, very good. And can you just give us a little bit of background if there are some folks who maybe don't know about how Kate Sander got started? What was the deal with that? Yeah, so um, so DataStacks has um, a uh, operator for Cassandra called CAS operator that you know is open sourced. Uh, it was sometime last year, and yep. there were, as it turns out, there are actually quite a few other operators for Cassandra. Um, one of the ones that that um, was more noteworthy was developed for by or uh, Orange from some folks based out of France called CASCOP, and. They presented at some conferences, uh, did some great documentation, did some really groundbreaking work with it. And uh, people weren't sure in the, in the Cassandra community, there were a lot of people who were already running Cassandra Kubernetes or who were looking to do it, but weren't sure what operator to use. So um, I had hooked up with, with Patrick McFadden and started a, a working group to try to figure out what, what is the best solution for the community. And I think there was some consensus that we could consolidate and come up with a, a community-based operator. And that was really the genesis of, of Kate Sandra. Um, it was because it wasn't just the operator, but also with other, there are other, there are other tools involved for uh, managing and monitoring Cassandra. Um, and in fact, some of that came out of the last pickle that with uh, my work at the last pickle where you know, we're telling, well, oh, you're, you're using, here's, the, here's what we recommend tools for managing Cassandra to make your life easier, and all of which are open source tools, and thought, well, gosh, these tools should exist in, in Kubernetes, and, and should be a, a complements to those operators, and, and that was kind of, you know, led to the, the creation of, of Kate Sandra. Very, very good. That being said, I don't want to, you know, steal your thunder or anything. So if you want to start sharing your presentation so we don't spoil anything, um, go for it. Folks, as usual, 
feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, John's also going to be showing some code. So once he starts switching to that, if for whatever reason you'd like him to zoom in a little bit more, just let us know in the chat and we'll do that immediately. So if you'd like to share your screen, go for it. Okay. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm really stoked to be here today. I'm going to be presenting Building Multi-Cluster Operator with an early look at the Kate Sander Operator. Um, so um, for the agenda, I'll give a brief background on myself, talk about why multi-cluster, do a little bit of intro into what are operators. Uh, we'll, then we're going to take a look at controller runtime, get into details in some of the various uh, components. Uh, and then we're going to look at specifically what do we need to do to go from a single or in-cluster controller to a multi-cluster. And then, then we'll uh, dig into a little bit of the, the Kate Sander operator and then, then we'll wrap up. Uh, so again, my name is John Sander. I'm located in North Carolina. Uh, I've been with Datastack since March of last year. Uh, I started working on the Kate Sander project about a year ago. Um, prior to that, I was at the last pickle working as an Apache Cassandra consultant for about a year. And then prior to that, I was at Red Hat for a number of years. Uh, and it was while I was at Red Hat when I was first uh, introduced or started working with, with Cassandra on a, on a um, ma management monitoring system. And uh, th that was early on, Cassandra about 1.2. Um, and then eventually a, a future iteration of that project uh, wound up being used in OpenShift for an early monitoring system. And that was my first experience with OpenShift as well as Kubernetes. It was actually pre-stateful sets. So that was a bit of a rocky road. Um, and we are, for folks, to, I guess, in the US, I'm not sure well celebrated, Halloween is right around the corner. Um, so I thought I would give a, a, a trick or treat. Um, so my kids on the left and on, on the right here is the handiwork so my daughters finally found a good use for their, their Barbies. Um, <laughs> now with that said, um, talk a little bit about Kate Sander. Um, so Kate Sander is a cloud native distribution of Cassandra is built specifically for Kubernetes. Uh, that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so it includes, in, so it includes Cassandra, but it also includes a number of tools for, to get you up and running with the things that you need tools for observability, um, your service monitors to integrate with Prometheus or any other Prometheus compatible um, backend, Grafana dashboards, Reaper for running repairs, which is to make sure your data is consistent across the cluster, Medusa for backup restore, and Stargate, which is an API gateway for Cassandra. Uh, Kate Sandra includes multiple operators, namely CAS operator, which is the uh, operator for managing and provisioning uh, your Cassandra nodes. And Kate Sanders packages a collection of, of, of multiple Helm charts. And there's actually a, a good bit of um, engineering and logic in the, the Helm templates themselves. And we kind of reached a, we felt like we were kind of stretching the boundaries with, with Helm. And that coupled with the desire to support uh, multi-region Cassandra clusters led to the decision to sooner rather than later start work on an operator. And, and that's going to be the basis of, of Kate Sander 2.0. Uh, and so lastly, um, definitely check out the project at KateSander.io. Um, you know, we're trying to build the community. It's open source and, and love for you to get involved. So now let's talk briefly, why multi-cluster? Uh, Cassandra is designed from the ground up for multi-region. Uh, it, it's partition tolerant. Nodes are smart in that they will automatically route traffic to nearby neighbors. Uh, the cluster is homogenous. Your, your clients can send requests to any node in the, in the cluster. And the data will be automatically and asynchronously replicated. Um, and, and typically, it's usually best practice, be good idea to configure clients to route traffic to the local data center. Uh, if you're not familiar with Cassandra, a, a data center is, is basically a logical grouping of nodes uh, that has its where you can configure replication for each of those uh, each data center. And so, uh, if I have a, a data center east and data center west, for example, and the clients sending writes to east, the those writes Cassandra will automatically and replicate those writes in the background to the west nodes in the west data center. Uh, so. Kubernetes, on the other hand, really wasn't designed 
uh, from to for the for, for being multi-region. Um, one of the big challenges is increased latencies. Um, when I was there lo looking, actually, it was interesting in the etcd FAQ, there's a question about running etcd across multi-regions or multi-data centers. And part of the answer I have here, it says the cost is higher consensus request latency from crossing data center boundaries. And, and there's a number of tickets um, with, where, with dealing with problems with, with latencies and performance with, for in, in etcd. And as, as you know, etcd is the data store for Kubernetes. So if you start having a lot of latency spikes and performance problems in etcd, that's going to have a cascading domino effect. So as a, as a result, these and other challenges, we've seen there's a lot of exciting work going on in the multi-cluster space in, in Kubernetes today. All right, now we'll do a, a quick intro to operators. Uh, so if some of this may be familiar territory, so I'll try to be quick, but I think it's important to cover, uh, lay, lay the foundation for some of the things that we're gonna discuss later on. Uh, so what's an operator? Well, an operator is, it's a Kubernetes native application. What do I mean by that? Well, it's designed to run, specifically designed to run in Kubernetes, working with Kubernetes APIs. And it has domain specific knowledge for an application. So I, I, I like to think of it this way. I have uh, some run books for my database for uh, performing upgrades, rolling out configuration, up, configuration updates. And if I'm gonna build an operator, I want the operator to automate those run books. Uh, operator is gonna be typically built with operator SDK or, or Kube Builder. And it consists of custom controllers and custom resource definitions. The diagram below here, uh, is, is the operator capability model, or it shows the different levels, uh, capability levels of an operator. Um, I included this mostly just to give you a, a sense of what types of functionality you might expect from an operator. Uh, and and uh, so, it, it, if, so if you're not familiar with operators, this is kind of, it's a, it can be a pretty useful diagram. So I mentioned controllers and custom resource definitions. Well, Kubernetes itself is comprised of a lot of controllers and a controller manages objects of one or more Kubernetes types. So you have a deployment controller, for example, a stateful set controller. Uh, and there's a well-known controller pattern, which is depicted in this uh, diagram, this control loop where the controller is just continually checking the desired state and, and the actual state and making and doing whatever it can to make sure that the actual state of the object matches that desired state. So, well, now let's see, what, what do we mean by desired state? Well, here's a, here's a manifest for a deployment, for an Nginx deployment. And this represents the desired state. I wanna deploy Nginx 1.14.2 with three replicas. In addition to what I'm declaring here in this spec, the desired state would also include any uh, default values that get, would get initialized when, when, the, uh, when I create that deployment. Now the actual state, when I create the deployment, we'll see that there's this, it has a status. And that represents the, the it uh, gives me a summary of, of the current state of the object. Where now, where I'm usually the person or, or there's some other actor in the system, or whether it's the end user or some other actor that's creating the deployment and modifying the spec, typically it's gonna be a controller that will update the status of an object. And it's also worth noting that the status is something that should be, could be something that could be recreated at any point just by observing the, the actual current objects in the system. And that's something that's important to, to be aware of as you're developing or implementing uh, controllers. Okay, so next um, I'm gonna take a look at a, what I find to be a really, really good diagram. So just let me know if this is hard to see and I'll, I'll zoom in on it. Uh, this diagram here uh, is, there's a lot going on um, and I only wanna highlight a, a few things that are relevant for what we're gonna discuss later on. So I'm not gonna go through everything here. In the upper right here, we can see we have the API server. And so this is this diagram des describes some of the, the, the components involved with client go and, and the interactions with it and the control and our controllers. So initially, uh, client will send a list and watch request to the API server for objects that it's interested in. 
so let's say in de deployments. And, and then the, uh, there's a, a cache that's gonna get populated uh, with, with the objects that are of, of interest. And then when the API server, when, when there's uh, events of interest, objects is created or modified, the API server is gonna notify the client. And on the client side, there's this, com there's this uh, component called an informer. And the informer will, does a, will do a couple of things. It's going to, um, it's gonna, the cache is gonna update the cache with, with that object. And then it's gonna notify an event handler. And that event handler is going to take that object, take a key, which, which, can be, which will identify the object, add that key to a queue. And that queue is managed by a controller. And the controller will then, when, when it sees there's something on the queue, it's gonna pop the item off the queue. And then it's gonna do, you have this process item, which is based a function where the actual work is done to make sure that the actual state matches, matches the desired state. So now, I want to take a look at a concrete example of that process item function. Uh, this example is taken directly from the controller implementation in the controller runtime library. Uh, and th there's, there's really not a whole lot going on. Um, the, the function, it pops an object off the queue, it checks to see if it's shut down. Uh, and then the next thing I really just want to highlight is it calls this reconciler handler method to do the actual work of, of making sure the desired state and actual state match. And, and, and that's it. Um, and now I also mentioned the, the control loop pattern. So I wanted to show the, also show the corresponding code for it. And not terribly, not terribly exciting, that's it. This is type for loop where it's just calling the process next work item. And now it's, it's also worth noting that controllers are, they're controllers that are written uh, that don't use a control runtime or predate control runtime. And, and they're going to follow this same, same control loop pattern, even if the code may be a bit different. Um, so then I'm, so we, so that's a little bit of background on controllers and also mentioned that operator consists of custom resource definitions. Uh, custom resource definition is a way to extend Kubernetes API. Uh, they can be dynamically added and removed. So you can add a custom resource definition to a Kubernetes cluster at any point. Operators are typically define one or more CRDs, and it's usually a standard practice where, that you're going to implement a controller for each custom resource definition. One thing, one thing really quickly on that is that we had a speaker one time who said that his favorite feature in Kubernetes are CRDs. Would you agree, or do you have something that's even better? Uh, no, I, I think once, I, yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think the two words that came to mind when I started learning about CDs, I said game changer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, it, it's, yeah, it, it's you, so much of everything we do now with Kubernetes, it's it, with through CRDs. Um, and it, 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 it's so, it, yeah, total game changer for, for, for Kubernetes, in my opinion. Awesome. Um, this, uh, here's an example of a custom resource of a uh, the a Kate Sander cluster object, which is installed by the Kate Sander operator, and so and here's why I say it's a game changer. Um, and we'll get more into this a little bit later. But this custom resource declares the desired state of this resource as create a multi data center Cassandra cluster that has two DC data centers, DC one and DC two with DC1 being in the East cluster and DC2 being in the West, cl West cluster. This is, an, here, the declarative model of Kubernetes with custom resources, extremely powerful combination. And I don't, as a user, this gives me a really powerful set of tools without having to understand, necessarily understand all the plumbing that's going on underneath to make that happen. Um, so now I'm going to shift gears and we're going to look at controller runtime, get into some of the some of the implementation details of controller runtime so that we can understand what's needed to go to make a controller multi-cluster. Uh, so let, first, what is control runtime? It's a library, it's built on top of client go for building controllers. It's used both in operator SDK and queue builder. And if you're writing an operator, uh, controller runtime is the provides the primary set of APIs that you're going to be dealing with in your operator code. In fact, uh, you may not even need to use client go directly. 
in addition, uh, Control Runtime also provides some really good tools for integration testing. So now I want to do a um, go through some of the the, the important types. Or, um, these are in Control of Runtime, uh, and and everything I'm going to mention here. These are all Go interfaces, um, and it's uh, just. And then we're going to take a look at a walk through some code, and I'm going to you know, highlight these types and and kind of tie it all together. And it's um, we'll, and we'll see how this kind of ties in with the with the multi cluster controller. So first is a runnable, and runnable is just a simple interface that defines a start method. And there are if you look at the controller runtime code, you'll see that pretty much everything's a runnable. And then we have a cache. And if you think, look, think back to that, that diagram that I pulled up a little bit ago, we have the cache. And this corresponds to that. And it stores Kubernetes objects. And it provides the informers, which enable the event notifications for our controllers. Uh, and then we, there's a, a client object. And that provides APIs for, the, for doing CRUD operations, creating my objects, doing the updates and deletes. Uh, and the, the clients can be configured to either read from the cache or directly from the API server. By default, they'll be conf and by default configured to read from a cache, and that's generally what you want to do. Uh, and then we have a cluster object, and that is an abstraction for the actual Kubernetes cluster that, that you're talking to. And a cluster will initialize the cache and the client. Then we have the controller. And uh, mentioned before that it has a work queue that it manages, it creates a queue and manages that queue, and it calls the reconciler. When you're when you're if you're implementing an operator uh, using operator SDK or queue builder, you're you're going to be implementing reconcilers. You're not going to be implementing the actual controller function itself. You're doing you're going to be implementing these reconciler objects, and that and that's going to contain the logic of the actual domain specific logic for making sure that the actual and, and desired state match. Then we have a, a source, which represents a source of events. So in the, the code example we're going to look at, we're, we look at it's, it involves memcached, so or, or a deployment. Um, the source might, would be, uh, an example would be a de uh, the deployment. And a source also has a very important role of registering those event handlers to push work onto the controller's work queue. And then lastly, there's a manager. Uh, the manager is, Kind of responsible for bootstrapping everything. It initializes dependencies that are used by, across all your controllers in the operator, most notably the, the cache and the client. So for you know the components that you need for interacting with the API server, and will wire up the dependencies, uh, and then it will also start your controllers. Um, and the the startup for starting up the various components, the the controllers as well as the caches is actually a pretty non-trivial operation. There's a lot of concurrency involved and that's and the manager abstracts all of that for us. So now we'll do a, a quick, a brief code walkthrough. And um, here's a link. So for the code, um, I, have, I don't have anything on GitHub. I simply just uh, did follow the first few steps of the operator SDK tutorial to generate the scaffolding for the, the sample project for a um, MCACHD operator. And we'll we'll take a look at that now. All right, let me make this bigger. Okay, so again, this is I have not written any of this code. This is all just generated from the the, the scaffolding, uh, and this has everything that we need that for to for the purposes of the discussion. So the, the main function here this is the entry point for start for stop starting the operator, and and the the, the first thing I want to to highlight is this call to this uh, new manager function, which creates as its name implies creates the manager object, and not only does it create the man so when the manager is initialized, that will also take care of initializing the cluster object, which will create the the cache and the client. And that cache and the client are exposed to us through the manager. And so next uh, we see, I have a memcache D reconciler type here that we're initializing. And you'll see here again, I'm creating, uh, initializing a client field and I'm accessing that through the manager. 
and we're calling the uh, setup with manager function or method. And we'll take a look at that. Now, there's only a few lines of code, code here and using the builder API from the controller runtime. There's a, a few things that are happening here that are really, really key. Uh, the first thing is, this is where the controller is actually getting, the actual controller is being created. The controller is being added to the manager. And then we're setting up a watch on for memcached objects. Now, I, I missed something. I'm going to go back briefly. I mentioned that the manager, when we created the manager, it's creating the, the cache and the client. And then here we're creating the controller. They're created, but uh, they're not usable at this point until we actually, so I'll go back, until we call down here, the manager.start. And, the man, and that start method is responsible for making sure that everything is started. Uh, there's, a, the sync, there's a sync that has to happen with the caches. All of that has to be done and the controllers have to be started through the manager. So that's a, it's a really key piece. But now, now I want to look a little bit more at what, what we mean by setting up a watch. Well, I mean, when a memcached object is created or updated, I want my uh, basically, I want my controller to get notified and have this reconcile method called to do whatever work it needs to do. So I'm going to jump over here into the uh, the builder code, and and um, I just want to, we're going to highlight a couple key uh, lines of code to show you what exactly is going on under the covers. Um, so if you haven't seen this code before, and, and, and don't, don't worry if it's if it's it looks a little confusing. Just these two lines here um, that I have highlighted are the, what I want to discuss. We're creating a source, which I mentioned before, represents the source of events, and and the type is a the actual source we're creating is a is a kind kind object, and the documentation here says that a kind provides a source of events that originate inside the cluster, and then we're creating our event handler for the particular object. In this case, it's a memcached. And then I'm control and then it's calling the watch function of the controller, which I'll take a look at that. So the controller, the watch function, it, and it, it injects the cache into the source object. And it checks if the uh, if the if the controller hasn't started, it just adds the um, uh, the source to a list. Otherwise, it, we'll call this the, um, the start method on the source. And so one way or another, that start method will get called. And then there's just a couple things that I want to point out from the uh, that source method. So I have a kind object here for my memcache D. And I have a go routine where the work is done. And two, there's two things I want to to just uh, draw your attention to. Um, well, actually, yeah, two things. Um, right here, I'm getting the informer for the particular type. So getting the informer for the MCASD type. And remember, the, the informer is responsible for, um, for tied in with the event handlers and updating the cache. And then down here at line, let's see, where is that, 133. I'm adding an event handler, registering an event handler with the informer. And we see here the event handler, it's being initialized with the queue, which is my controller's work queue. So when, when, I, when, when a MCASD object is created or updated or deleted, the informer is gonna get no, will get notified and it's going to uh, call this event handler which will then create a request that is added to the work queue of the controller. And the controller then will call this reconcile function uh, at where the actual work is done. All right, so that's a, and it, let me exit there. All right, so that's a that's a kind of a, a, a quick walkthrough of of the various components involved with a um, 
setting up a, a controller and, and some of the, the, the components, the controller and the watches. So now let's talk about multi-cluster controller. What do we need? What do we need to do if we wanted to take that controller or and 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 make that um, capable of being multi-cluster? Um, first, let's talk about the design for a multi-cluster controller um, based on what the some of the things we've discussed. And and these are some of the things that in in there, during the development, some of the early development on with Keith standard operator, some of the things that we were trying to to figure out and. And with Kate standard operator, we could be dealing with an arbitrary number of clusters. And uh, well, we don't want to have to deal with creating a separate controller per cluster, uh, because that would mean that we would have multiple work queues. And that just doesn't scale and it gets would get really, really messy as we'd have to somehow coordinate between those controllers and, and work queues. Similarly, I don't want to have to deal with creating multiple managers. Uh, manager objects. I want to have a single manager object that whatever I need to for uh, multi-cluster, I, I want that single manager to be able to manage the life cycle of everything, keep things easier to maintain. Uh, so as it mentioned, the, the you have a cluster object that provides the cache. So for each cluster, each Kubernetes cluster that I want to interact with, there's going to be a, a cluster object. And I want the manager to be, that one manager to be capable of initializing and starting the caches for each of them. I need to be able to configure watches so that I for across those clusters so that if the um, in the case of the memcached if, if if I have clusters east and west and uh, and and the object is memcached is, is modified in west I want my controller to be notified regardless of where it's running. And I, and everything should be able to be done with a single work queue and reconciler. I want all all of the events and all the work to funnel into a single reconciler. So next, I want to point out this design document, which is, and I'll, I'll pull this up real quick. Um, I'm not going to go through this. This is from the controller runtime library. If you are interested in uh, building a multi-cluster operator controller, um, this is definitely worth the read. So I just really wanted to highlight and point this out. But this also provides, this document also provides a really a uh, good example of what is needed to do to create a multi-cluster controller. Um, so here is the example. And let me make that a little bigger. All right. Um, so in this example, there is a we will, there's a two clusters, a reference cluster and a mirror cluster, and this is uh, managing secrets. And the, this controller will copy secrets from the reference cluster to the mirror cluster. In the, recon, here, in the reconcile function here, so when this is invoked, it first looks up the secret in reference cluster. If the secret exists, we go down here and then check to see if it exists in the mirror cluster. If it doesn't, we create a copy of the secret and write it to the mirror cluster. So there, there's nothing to, um, it's pretty straightforward. And the next in this new secret mirror reconciler function um, is responsible for wiring up the controller. Um, first here, it creates the controller objects. It sets up the watch for secrets. And then here is the, the new and interesting part. It's creating a source calling this new kind with cache method. So it's, uh, I showed you code pre in the, uh, that walkthrough for the memcached D example that was creating a kind. Here it's similar, except there's a second argument where we're passing the cache for the mere cluster. So that is allowing this effectively allows us to set up a watch for, or and get notifications from a different cluster, an event handler for a different cluster. And then, and, the, and then here's the main function um, that, that starts up the cluster. What, it, what this example doesn't show is uh, how do we get the um, access to the mirror cluster? And we'll, we'll get into that um, as we start looking at the uh, Cake Sander operator, which is coming up now. So, Cake Sander operator is an operator for Cake Sander, as its name implies. Uh, so it, it's 
there's a number of, um, in addition to Cassandra, there are a number of components included with Kate Sandra and the operator. In addition to installing and configuring and managing those components, one of the primary drivers for the operator is to support multi-data center, multi-region Cassandra clusters. The operator consists of a control plane and a data plane. Uh, the control plane only deals with objects that exist in the API server. It's not, it's not spinning up pods. Uh, the, for now, the control plane can only be installed in a single cluster. Um, the data plane can be installed in any number of clusters. And the, the control plane cluster can dual function as the data plane. So for example, we in automated tests, we'll spin up two clusters. Uh, one cluster is a data plane and the other one functions as the data plane and the, and the control plane. Here's the architecture diagram of the operator. And in we have three clusters here. In the top, we have the control plane cluster. Uh, and, and excuse me, back up. We have the, so the first thing to note is we have the operator deployed in each cluster. And in the top I have is the control plane. And I have then the data plane clusters on the bottom. And we, so we can see that the operator is, is um, it's configured to be running as the data plane. It's also, there's a couple of things to, to point out here. First is um, the, what was in these two data plane clusters look to be the same. There are no restrictions that uh, about that things need to be, um, they can be, it can be completely heterogeneous. So the topology in uh, cluster one here could be completely different from cluster two. So I, I could have a uh, Cassandra data center in DC1 that might have, uh, you know, 10 nodes with, or, or, you know, spread across so many racks and, and completely different number of nodes with different resource requirements in DC2. Uh, and we see we have Stargate in each, I, you know, I, I, so it's, it's completely, um, completely flexible in that regard. One other requirement, though, for the operator for Kate Sandra is we need routable IPs. Uh, we assume require routable IPs between pods uh, for Cassandra, and that's in order for Cassandra pods. They for the gossip protocol, they need to be able to communicate with one another. So let's revisit a the Cassandra cluster. Kate, I'm, excuse, I'm sorry, the Kate Sandra cluster object, and look at it a little bit more detail. Uh, the first thing to note is I have this data centers property and the operator will create a Cassandra data center object for each object in that data centers array. And uh, the Cassandra data center is another custom resource that comes from CAS operator. Uh, and then you see there's a, a Stargate property and the operator will create a Stargate object for each for each one of those Stargate properties. And Stargate is a, another custom resource that's installed by the Kate Sander operator. And then lastly, I have this Kate's context field. And that tells the operator in which cluster to create um, the, the uh, Cassandra data centers and, and the Stargate instances. In this next diagram here, um, the, there's a couple of things that I wanted to highlight or, or start to think about here. First, that there is a parent-child relationship between the Kate Sander cluster object and those other objects, namely the Cassandra data center and Stargate objects. There are other objects that are created as well, but, but for, no, for now, I'm just focus on, on these. And the... Um, Normally, if I'm dealing with, um, go back to the example of I, earlier in the, the slides, I had an example of a deployment. When I create a deployment and then for Nginx, um, the deployment controller creates a uh, replica set. The replica set will create my pods. And there is a parent-child relationship there and uh, a owner reference is set on the replica set and then on the pods. And this, where this comes into play is with uh, deletion and garbage collection. I delete the deployment. There's a cascading delete that will happen. The replica set and the pods will get deleted. 
Well, there's a stipulation. Owner references can only be used for objects that exist, that reside in the same namespace. So here, um, the objects, they can be in different namespaces. They can also be in different clusters. So the owner reference doesn't really help us out. Um, it's, not, it's not applicable here. The other thing is that I want to mention, draw attention to is when, when there's a change to um, the Kate Sander cluster object, obviously the operator wants to be notified and, and um, perform any change, any work that's necessary. Also, if there's some modification or change to the child objects, the Cassandra data center or the Stargate object, the operator wants to be notified and make what any change is necessary. So we want to be so we need to want to we want to set up watches on those objects. Well, here's how I would normally set up a watch for those objects. So up top shows an example using the the, the builder API. Um, and see it's in bold here, the, this owns method, which will nice succinct way to set up that, create that, um, set up that watch. And that's equivalent to the code down below calls the, the watches function, which creates the source for, and then specifying the Cassandra data center as the type, and then creating the event handler, which says, uh, create uh, and queue a request when the, when the owner of the object is a Kate Sander cluster. So uh, this doesn't work though, because the owners needs to be in the same namespace. And uh, as it turns out, um, you can actually do this if when the objects uh, exist in the same namespace in different clusters, but I learned the hard way things go can go bad and it, and it it doesn't work as expected and so it really only works when the objects exist in the same namespace within the same cluster so we need a way then to set up those watches on on those child objects on and so that an events get triggered for the parent Kate Sander cluster object uh, and the example in that document from controller runtime didn't really get show how, how to make that happen. So there's a couple of things we can do to, to achieve this uh, with labels and a mapping function. The operator will add a label uh, named katesander.io slash cluster to every ob object that it creates. So every Cassandra data set, every Stargate object. And then it's gonna use a NQ requests from map func objects um, to provide a, that's a mouthful, it's gonna pro that'll provide a transformation on the source of the event. Uh, so that, and then and the output of that transformation can be zero or more uh, reconcil reconciliation requests. All right, so now let's take a look at what that looks like in practice. Oh, so first I have a map, my mapping function here. And it takes as an argument a client.object, which is another interface from controller runtime, which represents an arbitrary Kubernetes object. And we get the labels on the objects and check to see if it has that cluster label. If it does, I'm creating a request that will be returned. Um, and, no, was, and then after that, creating this, again, we see this new, new kind with source where the kind here is the Cassandra data center and then passing a remote cache and then calling the, um, the watches function, which passing at the source and that and the NQ requests from MapFunk event handler. And the Kate Sander operator code, um, this is actually done in a loop where for each of the remote clusters and not only doing it for the Cassandra data center, but for the Stargate objects. And then as we add other uh, objects that we need to create and manage, that would be done there as, as well. Um, and, it, and it's also worth noting here that we're in this mapping function, we're not looking to see if the object is a Cassandra data center, we could, but so this, it's, this is mapping function can be used um, for any of the child objects, uh, regardless of whether it's a Cassandra data center or a, a Stargate. 
All right. So now let's we're going to shift gears and talk about accessing remote clusters. Um, but first, let's look about let's talk about what happens. What's for a accessing a, a cluster from internally within a pod, and and this is this is all how this all this is done within a within within a pod. Um, service account tokens and the API's root certificate are automatically mounted in the pod at those locations, and uh, environment variables for the API server's URL are injected into the pod as well. And this is all the information that's needed to configure a client connection. And so client go is knows to auto, knows to automatically look for these settings. And so when um, if you think back, if you remember the um, the example code I showed for memcached when I called the uh, the function to create the manager, it creates the it internally will create the cluster of it, which then initializes the client. So that client by default assumes running in cluster and will look for uh, the service account token and insert at these locations. So it, it, it happens pretty seamlessly. Um, so that's great for running in cluster. Um, now we need to do something. We need to figure out, okay, how do we make this work when we're accessing a cluster though that's remote? So when we're talking about accessing a remote, uh, accessing a cluster externally, we usually think about using a cube config. And this is how clients like kubectl work. Uh, cube config provides all the information that we need to access a remote cluster. We'll look at, we're gonna look at a, a few examples of, of uh, what we've done in, or different approaches we've looked at in uh, for Kate Santa operator. Um, we'll look at an example that uses a client certificate, one using the service account token and one using um, an OAuth token. Uh, so the first one example here shows a cube config using a client certificate. Um, this is taken. This is an example I just pulled from um, early early on in the project where from, that we used in automated tests. I create a kind cluster, and the kind cluster, uh, I'm sorry, kind will um, go ahead and generate the the cube config, and then we would use that in the project. Uh, and and we're and as, as I mentioned, we're no longer using this, and um, if and, uh, if you're interested, I, let me know, and I'll, I'll be happy to explain why um, later on. Uh, next is an example here of a G, for, of a cube config from a, a GKE cluster using the OpenID Connect token or OAuth token. And the problem with this is, so the you see in the bottom we have the auth provider section with an access token this. And uh, so that's an auth provider specific token that um, expires for, at least with GKE every hour. So I use if I use this with the, my op, with the operator after an hour, it expires and it's not going to be able to talk to the remote cluster. And in order to get the new access token, it, it would need to call G Cloud, the G Cloud CLI tool, to get a new access token. Well, this isn't really practical because that means in my operator's container, it needs to have G Cloud and I need to have something, I need to have a bunch of logic there for each cloud provider um, for their authentication mechanisms with whatever tool, thir whatever third-party dependencies. So, so that that's really um, not, not a very viable solution. So lastly, we have a cube config using a service account token. So recall I mentioned with the in cluster uh, configuration, each pod has the service account token automatically um, mounted. And this approach is nice because it's agnostic of any particular cloud provider and any um, auth their specific cloud provider specific authentication mechanism. Um, the, the downside with this though is that you need to create we need to create the operator's service account up front in advance in the remote cluster so that we can get that, so we have that service account token generated. Now in, in Kate Sander, for Kate Sander operator repo, we have a script that uh, tries to, to, to make this a little bit more seamless to help in that 
it will extract the service account token from the remote cluster, create the cube config file, and then store it, create a secret in with the cube config in the control plane cluster. Um, so I mentioned, so the secret is stored in, uh, so we, we have a script that takes that, generates the cube config and stores it, in a, creates a secret and stores it in a control plane cluster. Um, so now we need to, the question is, well, how does the operator find out about that? And the answer is a client config object, another custom resource that is installed by Kate Sander operator. Um, and a client config is basically a pointer to one of those cube config secrets. When the operator starts up, it queries for the client config objects. And then it will, for each one, it will create a cluster object. So it will then, it'll grab the client config and then the corresponding secret and extract the cube config and pull, uh, parse out the service account token in order to create the cluster object. And then it adds the cluster object to the manager. And it will, and then for each remote client, it, it stores it in a cache. And those cache entries are keyed off of the uh, context name, um, which we see over here in, in, the, in the spec, uh, we have the context name property. Um, Right now, this has to be done at startup. So in, in other words, if I have my operator running and I create, um, I want to create a, a new Kate Sandra cluster with um, some other cluster that I just spun up in um, EKS cluster, in order for the operator to be aware of that, and I create the client config, I have to restart, I'll have to restart the operator for it to be aware of it. So that that's, that's certainly not ideal. Well, the reason for that is the manager, when I add the manager to the, I'm sorry, when I add the cluster to the manager, the and, the and then we start the manager, the manager will start the cache. Once the manager has been started though, it won't start the cache. So if I add, if I create the cluster object after the manager is already started, and then I subsequently then add the, the cluster to it, the cache won't get started, which means not the remote cluster watches won't be created and wired up. So I, I created a, a ticket in controller runtime for this. I wasn't sh initially sure if, if this was just by design or if this was a bug and it turned out it was a bug. And, and so I had submitted a, uh, a, a patch for this. And so um, hopefully we'll see this fixed in, in a um, upcoming release of controller runtime. And then we'll, um, make the corresponding changes in the uh, key standard operator. All right, so now go ahead and wrap up with some closing thoughts. Um, so uh, key standard operator is, we're still early on in, in development, but um, hopefully, you know, with the example I showed in uh, from the con that controller runtime design doc, um, it, it's really not that difficult to implement. There's just a few lines of code enabled to make to so that your can controller can uh, watch objects and react to and get event notifications from a remote cluster, which is really awesome. Um, are there other changes that we might want to see in controller runtime to better support multi-cluster? Maybe I'm going to just say probably yes. I just you know I mentioned the the uh, issue I raised. To, so the manager could start caches after it's already been started. They'd probably need a complementary support for stopping a cache. Um, and and there, there are probably other things as, as well. Um, managing remote clusters, that, that can be challenging. Um, you know, there, there's went through um, a lot of work and I think it's still safe to say that for Kickstarter Opera, it's still ongoing for managing remote clusters. Not only just configuring the access and, and then also making sure things are secure and locked down, but what do you do in a situation where, you know, now we're getting to a situation where clusters are maybe they're ephemeral, they may come and go. And so um, what do we, how do we determine whether there's a, a cluster is just is gone versus, you know, there, there's some network partition and, and how do we deal with that? 
Uh, and then lastly, definitely take the time and invest the time and effort with automated testing. Um, I, you know, this is not specific to multi-cluster controllers. And, you know, it, it's worth noting that you can get a lot of mileage out of testing locally. When Cape Standard Operator, we have a um, full end-to-end -end tests that run with kind clusters locally for multi-cluster tests uh, we'll, that spin up uh, multiple kind clusters and, and uh, that works, works really well. So you don't need necessarily need, um, you know, two EK, multiple cluster, clusters running in the cloud to, to test multi-cluster. You can do things locally, which, which really helps speed things up with development and testing. And it also helps for, for contributors. So that is it. And that is oh. it. That is it. If you as if you only talked about two things today. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, actually, what, uh, future work. Sorry. But, uh, I'm sorry. Good. Good. Um, good. 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 Um, so the like I said, we're still early on with the development with the operator. There's a lot more in terms of workflows that we need to support: adding and removing data centers, taking up components. Like I said, um, so there, there's a lot there. Um, we've really just scratched the surface. Um, and then, of course, we want to release Kate Sandra 2.0. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's, that, that's the, 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 the big goal, get, get it out, get adoption, get, um, start collaborating. Um, we definitely need more testing and documentation around cloud providers and, and client tooling, um, you know, looked at, um, a, a, a colleague had at one point showed me a, a nice, uh, demo with some client tools with Linkerd one point, I think it was Linkerd that will, will does some pre-flight checks, making sure that you have connectivity across clusters. So things like that to provide the, to ease the, the user experience with kind of getting everything set up. And then lastly, um, if you attended QCon uh, North America, there's definitely a lot of buzz around multi-cluster, multi-cluster services. Um, I, I think that's something that we'll definitely look to get into um, post 2.0 uh, and, and see how we can leverage that for the operator. That's it. And once again, that's it. <laughs> There's just a few. One thing I wanted to ask though is that something that's come up a fair amount in our community has been with seeing all these different operators. Do you expect there to um, that that standards will start to emerge for operators? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I've seen there's been different projects. Uh, I think it was somebody with. I think eventually, and I, I think it would be um, certainly be beneficial um, because, for example, you know, in terms of in, in a number of ways, and you know, you want to have um, not, well, what I think well, standards for the operators, I think, in terms of just the CRDs and how you're structured, how, how what types of fields and so forth. But but I can also see a downside because what I might need for uh, Cassandra might be entirely different than what I need for, for some other systems. And, and hence, hence the difficulty. I suppose also because we see this with, with certain companies that are like, do we build our own? Do we buy it? You know, like, how do we go about doing this? And so in some ways to perhaps make that entry point a little bit easier because of the fact that it seems as for right now, for the short term, this is going to be one of the best solutions out there in order to, to with uh, relative ease, uh, get data on Kubernetes um, relatively seamlessly. So I think that in order to make that approach, but that's like, that's our job as a community. Let's get these conversations out there. Let's see the experience of Kate Sandra. We've heard from folks at Percona. We've talked to folks at, you know, Vitesse, PlanetScale, et cetera. So you know how these things are being approached. But I think there's this sort of urge or desire to get there. But as you said, the intricacies and ins and outs of every single database are gonna provide challenges that probably have to be responded in, in a more tailor-made fashion, I suppose. Yeah, and you know, this goes back to uh, what my slide in the, the operator section about the domain specific knowledge. So mm -hmm. I, I think um, with the controller runtime and operator SDK and Q Builder, they've done a phenomenal job of, of trying to um, really distill things down so that as, as somebody wanting to write an operator, I looked at that scaffolding and all, all the details that we were, a lot of those details we were covering. If I want to write an operator for, you know, you know I've got some data store and, and I want to work, I don't have to worry about any of that. I, I can get started. Now, eventually, yes, it, it helps to understand and have some, under, you know, to know what's going on under the covers. But if I'm interested in, in just getting started with, okay, I, I want to create a stateful set for my, my data store, make sure there's some persistent volumes. 
I don't have to worry about how do I write a controller? How do I you know, create my the client connection and manage the, 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 uh, the, the cache? That's all, that's all done. So that, that's, a, that's a huge step forward and allows me to focus on my problem domain. And I, and I think that, that gets us a, a long ways. Very, very good point. Um, with that, can you stop sharing your screen really quickly? Just because yeah. I have one final thing I got to share. Um, so I think we can all agree that this was a pretty awesome master class on, on, on the topic of opera. As, as like I said, we've had more than a couple of conversations about this. So it's, it's, but like I said, this, I think we got, we got a lot of depth and breadth. Um, so that being said, I just want to, we have a little bit of a ritual in our community. Um, while you were talking, we had a ama our amazing graphic recorder. Let me know if you can see my screen. So we had uh, we have our amazing graphic recorder Anko creating a, a visual description of all the stuff that was mentioned. He even was able to squeeze in a Barbie doll dressed as a witch um, in honor of the first picture that you showed, which I really liked. That was a nice way to start. Um, but uh, but obviously a lot of topics covered here, a lot of stuff to unpack. I was talking to John before we got started. If you arrived a little bit late and want to check out the slides, we're going to drop those in Slack. So no worries, those will be there too. And John will definitely be. We're going to be having you back. We we we've, we've the next thing we want to kind of uh, spin up is to get a panel just focused on operators to kind of compare and contrast the experiences to sort of you know like maybe we can't standardize operators, but we can at least standardize the conversations that we're having about them to make it a regular thing and see what's going on out there as we get more folks onboarded uh, with running data on Kubernetes. Um, John, the best way to, to follow you, Twitter, LinkedIn, any places where we should find you? Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm on Twitter, not super active. Uh, Twitter, link, LinkedIn, and um, you know, I, I'm, on, I'm on DOK Slack now. Um, I'm, you know, so, uh, and you know, the, the Kate Sandra um, Discord, so, um, you know, I, I, I didn't put that info. I'll, I'll drop it in um, on yeah, Slack. Yeah, drop it in Slack. Drop it in yeah. Slack. Yeah. Anyway, John's easy to find. Great speaker. Really, really appreciate your time today with John. And hopefully see you soon. Like I said, we got to get that panel going. Um, so we'll definitely be uh, letting you know. Thank you. This is awesome. Good. Glad you enjoyed it. Take yes. care, everyone.